Thank you, Pastor Aaron. It's really a joy to be here with you on this beautiful morning. We are all the way from Nairobi, Kenya, and I'm here with my beautiful wife. Babe, would you please stand and wave? Thank you. Thank you so much. We have three beautiful children that are really missing mommy right now. And uh, the one in the middle, her name is Misaki. She's uh, eight. Then the boy with the yellow t-shirt, daddy's boy, his name is Gideon. And the little girl with the serious mommy's face, that's Michaela. And she just turned a year and a half. And we are looking forward to being back home and being with them. You know, when uh, Aaron told me about this series that you're in, about finding God's will, knowing God's plan, I thought to myself, that's a question that even for me I ask all the way in Nairobi. I ask what is God's will for me at a personal level? What is God's will for us as a family? What is God's will for us even as a local church, as a local congregation? And I think that it's a very, very important question. Each one of us ought to keep asking ourselves that question in every single season of our life, in every single moment. There was a young lady. This young lady was 19 years old. She met a young man, fell in love, and then got pregnant. She discovered she was pregnant. You see, the challenge that this young lady faced was that she had been brought up by her uncles and aunts because her parents had separated at a much earlier, much younger age. And so this young girl at 19 years old began to wonder what to do carrying this pregnancy. At the early stages of the pregnancy, a lot of the people that are around her, a lot of the voices that were around her, they said, you need to get rid of this baby. Your life is already so complicated. We can't imagine what it would be with you having a baby. And as she fought in that tension, wondering what to do, whether to have this baby and give it up for adoption, or what to do, as this young lady navigated this tension, she remembered that she had a father, a heavenly father. She remembered this God that she had heard about, and she began to pray and ask God what was his will and his plan for that baby. You see, I'm so glad that that young lady at 19 years old kept that baby, because if she didn't keep that baby, I wouldn't be standing here on this pulpit today. That young woman was my mother. And as she carried this pregnancy for nine months, she prayed over this baby. And she believed that God had a great plan and a purpose for this baby. She believed that God would use this baby to touch and impact the lives of others as he grew up. You know, my mom passed away seven years ago. She got diagnosed with cancer in its last stage and passed on a couple of months later. But even until today, there are so many doors that I walk through that I know it's God answering the prayers that she prayed all those many years ago. I remember going to bed and hearing my mom pray. I remember her speaking God's promises upon my life. You know, as you ask yourself the question of what is God's will, what is God's plan for my life, I believe that the first place that you and I need to go to is in the scriptures. Because the scriptures tell us in Jeremiah chapter 1, God speaking to Jeremiah. And really you and I have to understand that Jeremiah grew up in a family of priests. So Jeremiah grew up exposed and hearing God's word. But you see, it's so easy for you to live a faith that's not your faith. You can live a faith that's your mom's faith or your dad's faith or your family's faith. And what happens is that Jeremiah has this personal encounter with God. And in that place of a personal encounter with God, he meets and he hears from God in such a different and intense way. We see God speaks to Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 1 and from verse 5, verse 4. It says, the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. In verse 6. Jeremiah responds and says, Alas, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. But the Lord said to him, Do not say, I'm too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you to say. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue you, declares the Lord. 
You see, Jeremiah had, a, had this gentle and tender heart. And God was looking, God was looking for a man with that gentle and tender heart for this and rewarding ministry of condemnation. Jeremiah's subsequent career shows that he had this quality in full measure. You see, as we ask God, what is your plan for my life? What is your will for my life? God is not surprised by that question. God is not wondering, what do I say? But God already had a plan for your life all the way from the beginning. Even before you were born, God did indeed have a plan for your life. So he says to Jeremiah, before you are conceived in your mother's womb, God had a plan and a purpose for you. He says to him, before you are born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. And I believe that it's so important for you and I that as we embark on this journey of discovering that which is God's plan and purpose for our lives, that we go back into God's word. You know, I love John 15. John 15 is one of my favorite scriptures. And it talks about really about fruitfulness and living a life of meaning and significance. All of us desire to live a life of meaning and significance. John 15 talks about the place of fruitfulness. In John chapter 15 and from verse 4, Jesus speaking to the disciples says, Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. And it's basically saying that the way for you to find meaning and significance is for you to stay connected with me. It's for you to stay in relationship with me. In verse 5, he says, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and with us. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and to be done for you. I love what verse 16 says, if you go down all the way. It says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give to you. He says, this is my command, love each other. You see, the beginning of us discovering God's plan for our life is finding ourselves in God. I love what Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says. It says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's basically saying to you and I that prioritize that pursuit of the ways of God, prioritize that pursuit of God's heart. It's not about God's purposes being centered around my life. It's about living a life that is centered around God's purposes. It's about allowing Jesus Christ to be really at the very center of the kind of life that we live. The word of God says, I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I think that we all have to come to that place of understanding that we are not where we are by accident. We are not a part of that family by accident. We are not here in Cleveland by accident. But that it's God ordained for us to be where we are. We're not part of this Fellowship Bible Church by accident. God has brought you here for a very specific purpose. And it's for you to ask, to ask ourselves, in this season that I mean, what is your purpose for my life? You know, the word of God in Acts chapter 17 and verse 26 says, From one man he made all the nations, that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out the appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God has marked out where you should stay. He's marked out your days and your time. Why? So that our hearts would seek him and be drawn towards him. You know, I remember going to college, and I went to college, my first degree is in computer science. And I went to college with all these dreams and aspirations of things that I wanted to do. But there in my first year, God began to target my heart. And I had grown up in a Christian family but I'd never really taken my faith seriously. And in that first year of my college education, I began to surrender my life to our God. And from that moment, this faith was not just my mom's faith, this faith became a personal faith. It became a personal journey for me. And I remember 
during those four years, I remember feeling this call of God upon my life to go into full-time ministry. And in my fourth year, in my dorm room, God spoke to me so clearly and I knew that he was calling me into a specific direction. And so I went ahead and graduated, finished my degree, graduated with honors, and went into full-time ministry, initially working with college students. A couple of weeks before I graduated, my dad called me, and he said, son, you're coming to the end of your college education. What are you thinking of doing in the future? And the reason why he was calling me was he had a couple of ideas of what I should do with my life after that. And I said to him, dad, I have this burden. I feel this call to go into full-time ministry. My dad was so disappointed by that decision. He said to me, you want to become a pastor? Because for him, pastors were really the law of the law. There were people that he gave handouts to, people that he did not think much of or look up to. It took my dad almost five years to ever tell anyone that his son was a pastor. Because he was embarrassed. He was ashamed. You know, when we talk about knowing God's will, knowing God's purpose for your life, it sounds like this rosy journey that we know his will and we walk this journey where it's full of joy. But sometimes following God's will and following God's plan for your life can end up causing you so much pain. For those years, I was like an outcast because I'd done something that was so much against what he wanted for my life. He'd taken me to the best schools, taken me to college. And here I was, taking a path that is so different from that which was the, his best thoughts or plan for my life. When we talk about God's plan, working in God's plan, when we talk about God's will, you and I have to be aware that it's going to cost us. And that's why Jeremiah is filled with this fear. He responds in verse 6, and he says to God, he says, Lord God, I am too young, how will I speak? How can I speak, yet I'm so young? What does Moses say? Moses says the same thing. He says, I cannot speak. And so many times, what keeps us from following God's plan for our life is the fear. The fear of what will happen when I step out of my comfort. It's the fear of what will happen when I step out of this identity that I've held on to for so long. You see, when you talk about pursuing God's plan and purpose, many of us want God to really give us this flashlight that we can see the direction in which we are going. And really, that's what we want. How God works is that I found him to be a God who says to me, just take the next step. Trust me in this moment, in this next step. You may not see where you're going, but just trust me right now, in this moment, walk in obedience and stay faithful where you are. Sometimes walking in God's will is really faithfulness where you are and a step of obedience in that particular moment. As you hear God in his word, as you spend time in fellowship with other believers, as you hear him speak to you in prayer, then taking that step of obedience and choosing to honor God by those little small steps that you take every single day. You see, walking in God's will, seeking God's plan for your life, it's not about the destination. It's not a destination that we are walking towards. It's the daily journey, the daily process of surrender of saying right now in this moment, what does it mean for me to honor God? Right now in this moment, what does it mean for me to make a decision that glorifies God? It's a moment by moment daily surrender. You know, when I was in college, one of the things that happened was that I met this beautiful girl. And I remember being in a meeting like this up at the front and looking at the back and seeing this beautiful girl sitting at the back. And I always thought that she was taken, you know, that she was dating someone. But after the service, I went and I said hi, and I began to get to know her. And for a couple of weeks, I was afraid of asking whether she was dating anyone, because I wasn't ready for the answer, that yes, she was dating someone. But then one day, I found out that she wasn't seeing anyone. She was single. And I asked her out, and we started this journey of dating. And as we walked this journey of dating, I remember going to my parents and saying, you know what, I met this girl. She's the girl that I'm going to marry. And she went back and she said the same thing. But you see, the two of us come from these two tribes in our country that don't marry from each other. These two tribes that have all these historical issues against each other. And along that journey as we dated, the one prayer that both of our families made was that this relationship would amount to nothing much. 
that somehow would just go our separate ways. And when we went back and we said, you know what, we want to get married, we are serious about this relationship, none of our families was willing to support us or work with us. And eventually, about four years later, four years of waiting to get our parents' blessing, I remember going with my wife to go and see her parents, and they said, you know what, you've waited for all this time, you've honored us, and we want to give you a blessing and release you to be married as husband and wife. But my side of the family, they said, you will not be apart. And so at my wedding, her side of the family was there celebrating, so happy for her. And my side of the family was not there. It's only my mom that came and my brothers. But the rest of my family did not want to come and be a part of this marriage. You see, so many times we talk about seeking God's will, knowing God's plan for your life. Sometimes it comes with tears. Sometimes it comes with pain. And you can be an outcast for doing the right thing. Anyone agree with me? That you can do the right thing. And it makes you an outcast. And now we've been married 11 years. I remember six years ago talking to my dad. And my dad saying, you know what? I wish you could have another wedding and I could come and be a part of it. But it's done. What is done? It's done. You see, God calls you and I to honor him in the small decisions that we make, but also in the big decisions. Honoring him even at great personal cost. And in that place, as we honor him, as we take those little steps, we get to see him reveal his will for us. You see, there are challenges along the way, and we must be ready to pay the price of following God's will. I don't know what it is for you. For Jeremiah, it's a only a child. How can I speak? Maybe for you is, I am not enough. I don't have what it takes. Maybe God has spoken to you about giving or serving or being a part of this greater family or fellowship Bible church. But as you have listened, there's this fear that is in you. you now my wife loves to say that there are people waiting on the other side of your obedience. That there are people waiting on the other side of your faithfulness and obedience. And the question that I would like to ask each one of you this morning is what is the most God-honoring thing for you to do in this moment? What is the most God-honoring decision right now? What is the most God-honoring posture for you to adopt in this season? What is the most God-honoring thing that God is asking of you right in this very single moment? You see, at our church in Nairobi, at ICC Nairobi, we are in a season where we believe in God over the next 10 years to win a million souls in our city and around our nation. We are believing God to raise 100,000 disciples in our city. We are believing God to be able to send into the marketplace 10,000 marketplace leaders. We are trusting God over a period of the next 10 years to be able to plant 100 churches within our country and through the different cities of Africa. That scares me. Because when I think about what it's going to take for us to accomplish that dream, it scares me. But the only thing that gives me the strength and the encouragement is to know that we heard from God, that we received that dream from God. And that's why I love this encounter that happens between Jeremiah and our Heavenly Father. Because in that moment of encounter, in that moment, God speaks to Jeremiah in such a personal, specific way. You see, God does indeed have a plan for your life. God does indeed have a plan for your life. But sometimes as we come and as we pray and we say, God, what is your plan for your life, for my life? We come with clenched fists. We come and there are these things that we are holding on to. We're holding on to our identity. We're holding on to our resources. We are holding on to all these different things. And as we come, yes, we're asking for God's will but we are holding on to things that God would want us to let go. And I believe that the most important posture for you and I to have is a posture of release. A posture that says, God, I come releasing everything. God, I come surrendering everything. God, I come seeking you, desiring that your will be done in my life. I love the words of John 15. It says, remain in me. It says, abide in me. In John chapter 15, Verse 4, remain in me as I also remain in you. 
stay connected. Remain in me, abide in me. That awareness that as we remain in the Father, there we will bear fruit, that we will be fruitful. You know, a couple of years ago, about 12 years ago, I had an incident, an incident that almost left me dead. I was walking one evening, I was walking out of our church facility, and as I'm walking along, along the road, these two men come towards me and they attack me. And basically when they attacked me, they asked me for directions. And they said to me, where is this particular place you want to go? But as I was trying to give them the directions for where they were going, they attacked me, they robbed me, and they left me there by the side of the road. They left me there for dead. And I remember coming back to my senses and walking about 200 meters back into a church compound. And the moment I walked back into that church compound, I collapsed in our parking lot. And I was unable to walk, I was unable to feel my hands. Luckily, there were some two pastors who were there, and they came and they picked me up, and they took me to Nairobi Hospital, which is one of our best hospitals in that part of Africa. And I remember being in that hospital, lying on this metallic frame, unable to move my hands, unable to move my feet. And I would be there in that intensive care unit, and deep in the night, I would be praying. I would be saying, God, give me back my hands, give me back my feet. And I had the best doctors. If our president was unwell, it's the same doctors that would attend to him. But they couldn't figure out what to do. You know, when you woke up this morning, I don't know whether you understand how complicated that process is for you to wake up and stand up on your feet. Here I was lying on this metallic frame day and night, unable to use my hands and my feet. And the doctors kept saying, you know, we're going to operate on your back and do surgery on your back and your neck, but we can't guarantee that the results will be good. And they kept arguing amongst themselves, and eventually they said, you know what, instead of doing nothing, let's go in and do the surgery. And they scheduled the surgery. But then the day before the surgery, I started feeling sensation in my hands and sensation in my feet. And about two weeks later, I walked out of that hospital without any surgery being performed on my body. God gave me back my hands. God gave me back my feet. You know, if you've never seen a walking miracle, at least today you get to see one. And I remember walking out of that, I remember walking out of that hospital and stepping out into the fresh air. And as I stood there, I said to God, I give all of my life to you. I will serve you all the days of my life. And that's all that I've done since that day. You see, when we come before God, we don't come with clenched fists, where we are holding on to things and our giftings and our talents. But we come and we say, God, we come with open hands. We come surrendering everything. And we desire that your will be done in our lives. And God reveals himself to us in that moment. He shows us the next step for us to take. And we live God's purposes in our lives. We live out God's will in our life a step at a time. A step of surrender. A step of release. It's a journey of faithfulness and obedience. Just a God I release. God I let go. You know, I don't know what season of life you're in right now. But the one thing that I know without a doubt is that God has a plan for your life. God has a purpose for you in this season. And maybe for you as we pray, it's the posture. Maybe there are all these things that you've held on to. All these things that have come to define who you are. You know, ease and comfort is one of the greatest barriers to fulfilling God's purposes. Because our eyes can be so locked into where we are. But God has a purpose for you beyond this city, beyond this nation. And as we pray, for many of you, it's letting go. And as you let go, just saying, Lord, with open hands, once more, I release 
and I desire your will and your purposes upon my life. So if that's your prayer, as I pray, I'm going to ask you to just stand up on your feet with open hands. Just saying, Lord, here I am. I desire your will. I desire your purpose for my life. Just with open hands. Just saying, Lord, I, I desire your will. Lord Jesus, we worship you this morning. We give you praise this morning. Holy is your name and mighty is your name. We look to you. We wait on you. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And our desire is that your will will be done in our lives. Give us the strength and the courage to be the men that you've called us to be. I pray that you'd birth new dreams in us. You'd birth new visions. That you would do a new work in us. For the glory and honor of your name. And as we stand before you with open hands, Lord, we open our hearts to you. Reveal yourself to us. Be glorified, O oh God, and be lifted up. As your eyes run throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are turned towards you, find among us men and women whose hearts are turned towards you. Find among us men and women whose hearts are fully surrendered to you. Open our eyes to see you. Open our ears to hear you. It's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray and believe. Amen and amen. Amen and amen.